Last night I was like, I don't have to be there at 945, but you hit that traffic wrong. So I did, I want to use the HOV lanes. So I, alarm clock goes off at 5, and I'm up to go. Traffic coming from my hotel was miserable. Once when I heard somebody said that there was like a package, somebody, somebody sitting at like 18th Street or something. They were oh, really? Oh, yeah. that's why it was so bad. Okay, so it's usually not that bad. Not that bad. Sure. <laughs> because I couldn't believe how long I was like, yeah, I should have just tried to walk. The rain, I decided to take a cab. The people who were telling me they were in 12th Street, they said it's a 25 minute flight here. Oh, my gosh. I don't know if they A package. That's the bad combo. So you just come in to get in before 6 o'clock? Yeah. And then the car pulls in? Yeah. Do you ever run into the problem of not being out by 6? Because don't they know? Oh, If you're not out by 6, they'll take it to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was kind of very close to this morning, actually. Really I'm just waiting nice to get caught. Where do you get this? this um, well, normally I take it all the way into the Pentagon. The this morning I got off that. Oh, oh <coughs> it's uh, right, at, right near the more the Quantico, right like before Quantico. Oh, so you're that far. I'm like way far down. Uh, 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 staff uh, yeah. way on down there. That's true. Sadly. And it's made difficult because Actually, that might be, uh, I had to drive in because I got to park the airport for the whole week-long conference gap in Miami. Heading actually to Boca tomorrow for a different meeting. So I'll be down We're both going to nice Good places. Yeah, how about that? Hopefully the rain doesn't follow. Yeah, so oh my nice. gosh, I hope not. 
<laughs> you guys are at the front. I'm glad. That's a nice hotel. Apparently, there was a um, you know, I, sighting I this morning of, uh, I'm trying to think of his name. Well, um, Regis and Kathy uh, Lee are filming uh, down there. Yeah. Yeah. So That's you can imagine the uh, media is yeah. the guy's name. I wish I could think of it. George Clooney. Is that what he is? Yeah, yeah. George Clooney. Oh, yeah. 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 We had uh, the name's there. But I remember years ago. 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 Years
I called them and and they said the biggest problem we have is we can't hire enough help at the wages that the Medicare reimburses us at. Help and meaning nurses and other Yeah, the doctors people. are there, but the nurses and the and right now they're looking for a hospital administrator and we just uh, can't keep up with with the wages that everybody's hiring them away from us for. And you know we're we're doing a, they're doing a wonderful job but we're it's all coming back to us farmers on a property tax to support our hospital. And you know, so is our I'm on the school board. Uh, so is our school coming back to the property tax. And you know, you can't you only come to that well so many times and we're we're tapped that way. Uh, Don and I have had health insurance the whole time. We I like to say I started with nothing and I still have most of it. <laughs> so you purchase your own insurance? We purchase our own health insurance, but that, we make it a priority to purchase our own health insurance. You know, our, our oldest daughter, the, the bill was the computer print out that high, $800,000 or more, and we, we wouldn't even pay the interest off with our premiums. But our, renter, our premiums just before we left this week, uh, you know, it, it's it's hard, but it's not bad. We are in a mm -hmm. uh, a uh, self-employed group of Blue Cross Blue Shields of Kansas, and it's we were five hundred dollars last year. We just got the notice we'll be five sixty-six a month this this year. Well, that's over twelve, you know, ten, twelve, eleven percent increase. I don't know. It, it's it's hard for the insurance part of it, but and I do know some of my friends and colleagues have that don't have insurance and some of them can't afford it some of them choose to not afford it uh, i'm you know i i think that we have a success story in our community as far as the health care but we have to do something about the costs and the reimbursement of health care uh, you know i was can't document this i was told the story over the tailgate of a pickup about a man whose wife wife uh, was in the hospital the last six months of her life had a blood clot. She had 132 doctors come see her, and you know he felt like his. They they were just saying, "Well, go get your 150 bucks a day. Medicare will pay for it. Do your consulting." And that that's why uh, you know, we can't do that when you only have four doctors in a hospital. We can't abuse the system to try to pad our pad our pockets and. Rural people won't do that anyway. We're we're got integrity. We're we're going to do what we we're going to get what we pay for, and we're not going to cheat the system. So I'm I'm feeling like the main some of the problems that we have isn't with the rural America as much in the cost of doctors, their their insurance they have to have, and their, and you know as far as one of the things that came to my mind, they were talking about mobile units. We have mobile specialty units come out of a, you know, my mother had a bone scan down a week ago and they have a mobile unit come out to do that from, from an hour and a half away to our hospital. And uh, it must be the doctors try to do recruiting themselves because we have lots of preceptors that come to, to train there to do some in, interns there. Um, it was a lot tougher to pay our our health insurance when we were younger, uh, just starting out, just starting with kids. But um, God's blessed us and we're doing well. Now we're able to keep up with our premiums. But um, I'm concerned about the expenses more than I am in my particular situation of, of access. I, I feel like, like I said, we, we're 60 miles away from a, a fairly good, uh, hospital where our local hospital is 20 miles away our kids go to school 30 miles away or I mean if they have a problem heart attack what have you have to rush somebody to Wichita we have flight for life we just pay for a helicopter pad there our county just keeps up we're trying to try to stay cutting edge so we don't have this can't re that we can't recruit doctors that's our story. It sounds like you've been able to stave off the recruitment problems that some other areas have had. But it's been a, it's been an investment in the community yeah. by the county. Sounds like it is. 
Wayne, I want to get you in here. You're from Maine, is that correct? That's right. I'm a recovering pediatrician. Uh, I got into medicine the same time the government got into Medicare. And I knocked around rural America. Uh, uh, we farm 150 rocky old acres in Maine and uh, have a diversified old family farm, some hay, some organic. Uh, fruits and vegetables on the UPIC operation. I'm on Medicare. My wife's insured, but the word's gotten around the neighborhood that although I no longer see patients, people come over to talk about their health issues. But <laughs> 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 there is a lot. I have an 80 year old neighbor who has never, man or boy, seen a doctor as a patient. He knows a lot about health care. He lost his wife to diabetes after all the catastrophes that happened. But, uh, uh, sort of makes the point that uh, we need doctors that patients can be sure work for them and whose word they can take. I'd like to tell you about the young couple down the road that they're, they're struggling mightily to get a an organic fruit and vegetable operation going. The kids are on Medicaid. They're on Girago, which is the state subsidized insurance price product knocks their annual payment for a two thousand five hundred dollar deductible down to six thousand a year and twelve thousand a year uh, uh, but without that supplement they would be paying that twelve thousand a year now for them and for most real people cost is the bottom line and it just offends me. You know, even clear out in rural Maine, we get the electronic edition of the New York Times. And you remember the, the commercials were saying the, the government's got to stay out of offering a competing policy because they can undercut us 15, 18 percent. You know, they can't offer a competing insurance policy. This is the well, public plan idea? That's the public yeah. plan. Well, for my neighbors, that is two or three thousand dollars a year out of their pocket to subsidize the commercial carrier. Do you follow what I'm saying? That, that the organization that you ran, Nancy Han, can, uh, in the Clinton administration, can offer an excellent the Medicare product. program. Yeah. The Medicare type program can offer an excellent product for two or three thousand dollars a year less expensively than the commercials can. Well this relates to the administrative costs that you yeah. have. So, right. so to offer that commercial plan, we're talking about a wealth transfer from struggling poor rural families to investor owned companies. And that's the kind of wealth transfer that we don't really need right now. So the challenge is, if the commercials want to offer that product, they ought to show that they can offer a product as economically as the government product. We're always talking about the inefficiency of the federal government. I guess I'd finish, finish with the product that even rural America worries about the out-year cost. You know, the, the federal, the, the health care costs are eating us alive. It dwarfs the, the Social Security issue. And we've got to think terribly carefully about how we organize to manage long-term health care costs. We don't have time to really uh, get into that, but that's a terribly complicated uh, um, long-term question. One last parting shot. Um, in my rather too long career, the number of docs in this country has gone from 160,000 up to 860,000. And we're talking about a doctor shortage. Somebody's writing in the New York Times, can we do health care reform with our doctor shortage? Well, it's not a doctor shortage, it's a maldistribution. And it but what we accomplish that by taking away resources or consolidating resources from the two smaller communities that are in the county, thus make it more difficult for those individuals to access health care. You know, we've had uh, a lot of discussion about the, the, the issues that are out there, and I won't reiterate those. One solution that we tried, our state associations tried, and are still trying to do, are uh, group health plans, the pooling that uh, Rhonda mentioned. Now, the only problem with that 
is that farmers and ranchers tend to be older. Uh, and so that pool is slightly less healthy, uh, probably, than the uh, just the composite of the American population. And then you, so you start getting adverse selection by those young farmers and ranchers who are uh, capable of going to the private market. And so the, the pooling and the group health plan thing is, has, has worked, but I can't say it's worked as well as probably it ought to. This report, and I didn't get a chance to look at it in its entirety, but referenced the access project, and I looked at some of that before I came over here. Over here. Just two points, and this gets to the real economic part of the matter for farmers and ranchers. The farmers and ranchers who reported financial problems spent almost one half of their income on insurance premiums and out-of-pocket health costs, and a quarter of the respondents reported that health care expenses contributed to their overall financial problems and caused them to postpone or delay making needed investments on the farm. So it's just like small businesses, it's exactly. just like large it's business, same, really. That's what farming and ranching is, is, is small business. And you know, USDA makes a, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, reference to the amount of non-farm income now that's supporting farmers. I would be curious as to how much of that non-farm income is derived because the economic decision by that family is to get group health coverage as opposed to whatever dollars they maybe could retain. Uh, you know, from the extra. extra I mean, non farm there. income is just a way of saying people go off the farm to get a job in order to get health yes, insurance. Health insurance. And it's totally, I hear that over and over that. again. Yeah, right. you said that too, Jody. Yeah. So it's a huge issue, and we uh, look forward to help assisting and finding solutions. And we need, we need farmers producing good food right now. Absolutely. Healthy food. Uh, uh, Dr. Knudsen, you said you had a comment on this. Yes, I'm Dr. Lon Knudsen from the National Opinion Research uh, Center here at the University of Chicago. It's actually based in Bethesda. However, um, when this survey was conducted, um, I was part of the University of North Dakota Center for Rural Health, and we did this survey in partnership with the Access Project. And one of the things that we found, to your point, 38% of the respondents said that they worked off farm specifically. If you look overall at their income, and a number of their spouses also then worked off farm. And I think one of the things that I was struck about, because I grew up on a farm in North Dakota, was that people are making more and more decisions based on their access to health insurance. And one of the things that was really clear, as you mentioned, farmers and ranchers on average are older. I know speaking with our friends from Montana, um, their sons are not going to be able to take over the ranching business because of the concern about the financial viability and the challenges that they see ahead being able to maintain a farm operation or a ranch operation and also maintain health insurance. But I think one of the things that sometimes also gets lost in this discussion is that not only do these farm and ranch families have challenges getting health insurance, if they decide to stay within their farm and purchase in the individual market, any person in that family who has a chronic disease mm -hmm. or any kind of pre-existing condition will ratchet up their health insurance premiums. And one of the things that many of the respondents in this survey identified doing was taking advantage of the high-risk pools that are available in a number of states to be able to <coughs> peel off that person, if you will, with the chronic health problems. But you know, again, it makes it very difficult because one farm family said they had one child on one health insurance product, a mother on another, and the remainder of the family on yet another. And we know how complicated health insurance mm -hmm. is to begin with. And when you have a family that is that um, fragmented when they're accessing health care, it makes it really, really difficult. But I, I do think there's some real good innovation in looking at for example, what you folks have done with the fishermen, and um, there probably are some legal lessons to be learned there. I agree. Lisa, do you have any comments from the Family Farmers Coalition? Well, I, again, thank you for letting us come today. Some of our member groups are here, and I think they've spoken really well of the problems. I know in particular one of our Wisconsin dairy farmers um, works 24-7, basically, as dairy farmers do. Um, his wife works I believe full time at Walmart for them to have health insurance for them and their two year old daughter. And still they go without the preventive care. And I think, as uh, Sybil said, you know, the farmers are trying to raise healthy food. We're, all, we're becoming more and more of, of what a concern that is and a need here. But we need, to, our farmers need to be protected. And people who work in rural communities can be protected so they can afford to bring us that good food as well. Okay. Yeah, that was ironic when you pointed out the challenge of 
people who are trying to produce healthy food staying healthy themselves. It really was. Um, I want to make sure, Neil. Oh, I'm sorry. John. I'm John Daly. I'm the Director of Research and Analysis at the Center for Rural Affairs in Lyons, Nebraska, population 962, and it's a no stoplight. <laughs> sorry, um, I didn't mean to start. You did. You did. <laughs> We're going to be hearing in, you know, this is being live streamed, so I think we're going to be hearing in from others who want to weigh in on this contest with the congressman here. <laughs> uh, we're also releasing a report this morning. I'd like you to have a copy. It's entitled The Causes and Consequences of Rural Uninsured and Underinsured. And it raises up an issue that I think several of us have alluded to this morning, and that is the connection between affordable and meaningful health care coverage and entrepreneurship. And as you've heard from several people here today, um, they're all entrepreneurs. And the rural economy is based so much on entrepreneurship, whether it be farming, ranching, fishing, or small business. Uh, and uh, your report points out the, the figures on small business coverage in rural America, the farm and ranch coverage in, in rural America. So how do we how do we provide affordable and meaningful coverage for our rural entrepreneurs, which are such a big part of, of our rural economy? If we don't solve the health care issues um, of small businesses and farmers and ranchers and fishermen in rural areas, we won't have an entrepreneurial economy, and that means we won't have much of an economy in, in rural America. Congress uh, has done much to promote initiatives to promote entrepreneurship in America. The president is very supportive of those, um, and this is another part of, the, of entrepreneurship. How do we allow people to follow their dreams, as Ted talked about mm -hmm. right from the start? These are people who have done everything we've asked them to. They've, they have an idea, they've uh, saved money, they started business. Well, they can't afford uh, health insurance for themselves, their families, and usually for any employees they have, and it puts their business at risk, it puts their farm at risk. So we really need to resolve this problem if we're going to have any kind of economy in rural America. One other issue I want to point out, and uh, Lisa just talked about it, is the issue of prevention. How do we um, how do we have prevention services? How do we live healthier lives in rural America? We have higher rates of obesity, higher rates of almost every, um, every chronic condition and disease, most of which are preventable in, in rural America. So how do we do that? Of course, the food issue is so important and more resources that allow for uh, preventative activities, both providers and community resources that allow for that. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here, and thanks for the report. Charles, you want to say something? Two or three quick comments. First of all, we're, we're honored to be here, and this is a tremendous community expertise is in this room. I'd like to thank the President. I think he realizes the interdependence of urban and rural systems. But I want to follow on John's point and, and, and chat about what Terry said. We, we, we talk a lot about rural entrepreneurship, but uh, the largest predictor of uninsurance in non-adjacent counties is do you work for a small business? Mm -hmm. So I want to make three points. Granularity is key, systems approaches are essential, and we have to think about how we frame new opportunities with intermediaries. There is no rural America. Everyone here will say, once you've seen one rural community, well, you've seen one rural community. <laughs> And that's very critical to how you think about this, because the micropolitan areas and the adjacent counties are going to do quite well. But in our frontier and remote counties, and in our high poverty counties, you're going to need very different systems. Bob made an important point, but it's very, very key to think about it. 90% of, 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 of farm income right now comes off the farm. Two thirds of farm families, one of them works off. But the reality is, in rural economies, 5% more work in their own business, but they make $17,000 a year, and in urban areas, it's 35. So right away, how we deal with that is very, very huge in terms of the, the return for fam foreign, uh, family income. Two points. I think we have a wonderful opportunity to think about the critical access hospitals and the FLEX program. That was an innovation in public-private link that build a geography around it. Going to our fishermen, building a community understanding around a healthy community framework 
which this wonderful Office of Rural Health calls, and we're so honored that Dr. Wakefield is here because you have a rural thinker. The reality is in our remote rural areas, if we were thinking about the fact that human services must link to health services, and if we were thinking about remote campuses in which initiatives that link healthy food systems from farmers to Medicare and Medicare, <clears throat> where seniors aging in place could link to health care for workers, and we were building new demonstrations that said, here's a campus in a remote community, but we're going to fulfill these functions, much like the fishermen did. There's a very unique opportunity here. I would also say USDA could be a huge partner in this. Uh, we have two, two leaders with very wise rural understandings in those two departments that have been governors, and I would urge us, urge us to think about new collaborations in regional campuses for these services. That's a great idea. And Governor Vilsack, from you know, day one, has been very interested in working on this, as you say, with Secretary Vilsack and Secretary Sebelius. That's a great idea. I wanted to just recognize Neil, and then I'm going to let the congressman defend his stoplight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I'm sorry. And Roger, I didn't call on you either. But, uh, okay. Neil, go ahead. Well, so I, I, I want to stop. Okay. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I think the congressman uh, identified that the, the struggle, uh, you know, trying to figure out how you're going to contain costs. And I just I want to say first, I think it's really important now, uh, more than ever, to be really clear about what that means and identifying uh, the, the cost of delivery as being the challenge as opposed to the sort of expense of the individual. Because the seniors and the growing senior population are rightfully uh, scared now and what they have for to show for their life's work now is Medicare and Social Security because the retirement's gone and so on and I I think it's so important to keep that in mind because it's easy to say oh we, you know we're gonna have a problem we're gonna have to cut it somewhere uh, where are we gonna cut it and I, and I want to come back I'm, I'm not a health care expert but I, I think Chuck at bringing the systems points home is really important and I, I think about a couple things one is like when I grew up we had school lunches right the women work they cooked out of the USDA's flour and you know lots of beets got dumped and one kid ate them but but you got a hot meal every day right? and, as, and as those systems changed and as the industries uh, that, that make uh, prepared foods came in you know I got dialysis clinics at 36 in Lindale in South Minneapolis where I work I got dialysis clinics coming in Hayward Wisconsin where I recreate with my wife occasionally Dialysis clinics in rural Wisconsin. There was a cancer, a chemo clinic in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, in the Fox Valley, where my mom finished her career and ultimately died of cancer. But why? Because of the stuff that's going on around. Having to have those kinds of delivery systems. But the, the dialysis stuff bugs me the most because it's like a reflection of diabetes and obesity and the economic opportunities that come from and just the kind of improvement in your quality of life that come from either growing your own little garden or getting at the farmer's market in the summertime or beginning to produce for the marketplace. The connections to USDA, the opportunities for economic development that come from producing local foods. This is not just about having a robust and a diverse system of food production. It's about bringing the schools and the education system back in here. We got free and reduced lunches. Why don't we make them something that's useful, that provides economic benefit? I mean, the thing that the president has done so well is connecting the dots. And there's a lot of dots to connect here. But what we're going to save money is to get us down on diabetes, down on health, uh, on heart disease, and you know, up on nutrition. And, we, you know, we don't have to debate about junk food, but there is no debate about it's good to eat fresh foods and there's economic opportunity with it. I hope we can find ways to continue raising that up and putting it out front here. And I'll say one last thing. One interesting thing we just discovered is that uh, Latino immigrants, which we've done a fair amount of work with in communities, so they struggle with jobs, they struggle with status, they struggle with access to health care. Turns out that a lot of them, especially those from Mexico, come from farming backgrounds. and. Uh, lo and behold, when you open up a community garden or you have some opportunity that connects to them, not in the dominant sort of, here's how you got every plot's way, they come in droves because they want to grow vegetables and they bring their kids and the kids keep out of trouble. Um, some of them actually want to farm. So we've actually now started to do some work developing uh, small scale free range chicken cooperative production systems that you can actually make a living. The capital costs aren't that much. 
the local community loves it, and you've taken families that are out of, you know, it's not like a systems thing yet, but you take a family that struggles, and you give them the opportunity as entrepreneurs to move up and out. And this is, like, it's one small example, but there's, I think, a lot of others out there that are possible if only we encourage it and uh, don't discourage the opportunities around it. So thank you so much. That's for great, this. and I appreciate your highlighting prevention and wellness, which is, as you say, a big part of President Obama's message. Roger, you're going to have the last word, then I'm going to let the All congressman right. wrap thank us up you. Here. Thank you very much for doing this. Uh, our national convention uh, was held about a month and a half ago. This is the Farmers and Union. The Farmers, National Farmers Union uh, National Convention. And uh, at that, we routinely adopt a special order of business or several special orders of business. This year, we did that again. And uh, one of those special orders of business was dealing with rural health care. This is a huge issue for farmers has been for all of my life. I grew up on a family farm. Uh, I, I lived it personally. Uh, I know, as a lot of folks have said, that it is the principal reason a lot of farm spouses go look for work, mm -hmm. is to get the insurance coverage. Uh, but the, the, in all of the things that I was gonna say have largely been said except for one, and that is that we have to make sure that we don't forget that healthcare is about people. Uh, on the way over here, sitting in the cab, going nowhere, uh, <laughs> I, got, I got an email from uh, one of our members who uh, heard that I was coming to this meeting uh, and had a long, long story about what had happened in their family. And uh, he is actually a grandpa, but he was talking about his son and daughter and the fact that uh, they had uh, his one of his uh, children had gotten married and had uh, a baby. And that first baby that they had, uh, of course, pregnancy wasn't covered uh, in, in the health care policy that they had. And eight years later, they are still paying for the costs associated with having that kid. Uh, they're still paying because a lot of you said about out in the, in the country, you know, we're going to make sure we take care of our bills. Well, you know, if you end up with several hundred thousand dollars of cost, uh, as a young couple just starting out on the farm to have a baby, and, it, you know, every dollar is worth a whole lot. Eight years later, you're still paying for that first baby. There's something wrong with the system uh, that imposes that sort of a burden on young folks for the rest of their lives, it, as it may well be. So the, the need here is very evident. Uh, there have been a lot of suggestions, uh, but there's no question that the problem really does need to be addressed and needs to be addressed. And so thank you very much for pulling this warm together. Thank you, and thanks for bringing it home, because you're right. We do need to keep that in mind. Congressman? Thanks. Uh, I want to thank Nancy Ann Mary, uh, and Mary for all involved in, in putting this together. And I want to I want to commend you two on bringing people in from outside of Washington and, and, and listening to them, because I think this is so critical as we try to, to begin this health care reform today. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, no one knows exactly what it's going to look like because it hasn't been written yet. Uh, I'm fortunate to be on one of two committees that will do most of the writing, Energy and Commerce, and on the Health Subcommittee. There's, there's 51 of us that are Conservative Democrats, and I call the Blue Dog Coalition. I chair their health care uh, task force. And we're going to be very involved in this whole process as, as well. But, uh, you know, I can't emphasize enough that, you know, this is about obtaining the cost. It's about making health care affordable and accessible. Uh, it's about forcing the private sector to do the right thing. Uh, because we've heard so many stories about the many failures <coughs> we have with the system the way it currently, it currently is. This is not about socialized or nationalized health care. There may be, there may very well be a public uh, plan option that will compete with private plans to get the private plans to start uh, doing right. Uh, that's one of the things that we're going to have to contemplate and consider. But, uh, but you know, the reality is half the folks already have national health care. It's called Medicare, Medicaid, and ARCID, and, ARCID and SGO. And and in some of you in this room are now fortunate enough to, to participate in those in those plans. Um, but again, it's about, you know, if people are concerned about the debt, you know, went from, from uh, 1789 through uh, 
2001, this nation went five trillion debt. In the following eight years, we doubled it. Um, and, and if you're concerned about the debt, there's no way to ever have a balanced budget again until we get health care costs uh, under control and contained uh, in this in this country. So those are some of the things that we've got to deal with and why we've got to deal with. All this is helpful to me. I can I can assure you that. And I, I'm impressed with how many people out stoplighted me. <laughs> <laughs> that won't happen again. <laughs> but, uh, I can tell you that. But um, uh, I, I can tell you that uh, I'm going to make sure that that you know uh, I was at the White House Healthcare Summit. Every discussion I've had with the president has been rural health care, rural health care, rural health care. I promise you that I'm going to keep rural health care at the forefront of this uh, debate because uh, it's it's wonderful if we can make health insurance affordable for everyone. But if health care is not accessible for everyone, then we really haven't accomplished anything, yeah, that's right. at least for a lot of the folks in this, in this country. So and, uh, I, I couldn't be playing this role if it wasn't for Nancy Ann Letton, so I want to thank her for, <laughs> for that. And, uh, uh, but no, seriously, I want to, I want to, this is helpful for me. I want to thank you for coming, and uh, I hope that you'll continue to Write us, email us, keep us informed. Of, as, as things develop, keep us informed on how you think we can, you know, if there's something else you think we need to know, let us know. I mean, we are listening, uh, which is an important part of, of this process that I think, quite frankly, was missed in 94. Uh, there weren't enough people listening. That's why we didn't get it done. Um, and this time around, I've been very impressed with how many listening sessions like this there have been and that people are listening. So thank you for hosting this. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you for your leadership. And uh, as he, he and his staff are very open and they're listening. And every time I see him, and I know every time the President sees him, he's talking about rural health care. We started off saying uh, that this is about the 50 million rural Americans who have difficulty getting access to health insurance. And I appreciate your being willing to come and really speak on their behalf. Um, we have a website, healthreform.gov, where I would encourage you to tell other people to, to write us and tell us about their concerns and what they're experiencing out there um, because we want to make sure we are listening and that we can take the message to Capitol Hill where the congressman's going to be involved in helping to write the, the next stage of this uh, legislation. I also want to thank Dr. Wakefield and her staff at HRSA for all the great work they're doing and they're going to have an important role in this going forward as well. So thanks very much for coming today and keep in touch with us please. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's good to meet you. Oh, it's and good everything. to meet you as well. Thanks for all the good points you made today and everything. Well, thank you. Good luck on your trip back. Sounds good. Thank you. Quick trip to Washington.